Thank you, Ted, for your gracious words of introduction. It's good to be with you today, and I am pleased to uh, pinch hit for your pastor. My wife and I have enjoyed listening to him when I'm not in the pulpit. You are most indeed blessed to have him as your pastor, and it's an honor to stand in this place today. I, I do know, I am not naive, I do know that a um, good many of you came today uh, expecting to hear Dr. Taglierini in the pulpit, and um, probably when you saw the pulpit, you wondered if you could make it out the door before anybody noticed. I'm aware of that. Uh, I've done this a lot uh, through the years, having been a seminary dean and a university professor. I, uh, most of the time when I preach, I haven't been a pastor in a long time. I was pastor of First Baptist Raleigh in the 90s. So when I preach, I'm doing this. I'm supply preaching for a pastor. Uh, and I know how difficult that is, both for the supply preacher and for the congregation. When I was dean of the Divinity School at Gardner-Webb, uh, I did a number of um, interims while I was there, First Baptist Shelby, First Baptist Statesville, uh, First Baptist Gastonia. And usually they lasted a couple of years. So it gave me uh, the continuity and familiarity with the congregation that I enjoy. But, but even that doesn't always guarantee a rapport with a congregation. I, I, um, a year or so ago, I was invited back to preach at uh, a church where I had been interim pastor a number of years ago. I was there two years as the interim. And the pastor they called after my interim uh, had taken ill. And so the congregation uh, called me and asked if I could come preach for a month. Uh, while he convalesced. I said, sure, I can do that. I hadn't been there in a while, so uh, I arrived uh, in the sanctuary early, wanting to re-familiarize myself with the worship environment and, set and setting. I sat there. There was no one there in the congregation. Uh, I sat there for a while. An older woman came in and sat on the pew next to me. Um, she looked at me. I spoke to her. She spoke to me. I didn't know her. She didn't know me. After a while, Curiosity got the better of her. She said, are you a visitor? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, I am. That was it. I didn't offer any more. Well, that wasn't good enough. She said, um, well, is this your first time here? I said, no, ma'am, it, it isn't. That was it. Well, she couldn't stand it. She said, um, so uh, you've been here before? And I said, well, I was the interim pastor here prior to your current pastor's arrival. She looked me up and down and she said, are you sure? <laughs> I said, pretty sure. And then she said, I've been a member of this church my whole life. I've never seen you before. <laughs> I said, ma'am, I don't know how to account for that, but I assure you, I was the interim pastor here, was here for a couple of years. She said, if you say so. <laughs> well, we sat there in silence for a while, and when it came time for the service, I went in the back, reintroduced myself to the staff, had prayer with the choir, and came out to preach. And I preached, and when the service was over, I was standing at the door greeting folk, and this woman <laughs> comes out the door, big smile on her face. And she puts out her hand, she says, it's coming back, it's, com <laughs> it's coming back. And then with level gaze, she looked at me and said, now I remember why I don't remember you. <laughs> I guess that's the way it is sometimes. <laughs> so I know, I am aware that for most of you, you don't know me and I don't know you and you don't care. And that's quite all right. We, we have other work to do. Turn with me, if you will, in your New Testament to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. And we're going to read <coughs> verses 9 through 20. Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. The word of God for the people of God. I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and endurance in Jesus, came to be on the island which is called Patmos 
because of the word of God and the witness of Jesus. I came to be in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice, even as a trumpet, saying, that which you see, write in a scroll and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice which was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, wearing a robe and girded about his loins with a golden belt. His head and his hair were white as white wool, just like snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze, having been fired in an oven. And his voice was as the sound of many waters. And having in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword. And his appearance was as the sun, shining in all its power. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet, even as dead. And he put his right hand upon me and said, Don't be afraid, I am the first and last. I am the living one. I was dead, but behold, I am alive unto the ages. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Write, therefore, that which you see, both that which is and that which is about to take place after these things. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the churches. Somewhere in his writings, though I cannot now remember where, C.S. Lewis, as only Lewis can, depicted with stunning clarity the gravity of certain moments in our lives, which when we look back on those moments in, in retrospect, we realize these moments were climactic. They were, they, they were watersheds, they were turning points in our lives. But at the time, <laughs> we didn't realize how significant they were. Lewis, making that point, says, if we could see our lives from the angel's vantage point, from the perspective of heaven, he said our lives would look very different. It's, it's as though whenever we embrace such moment, these moments take such density, such significance. There's so much at stake, so much riding on what we do or what we don't do. It's as though the angels of heaven are leaning over the balcony, watching us, gasping in silent vigil, holding their breath, waiting to exhale to see what we're going to do. Oh my, will he do that? Oh no, is she going to do that? And they gasp knowing the consequences and the stakes. Lewis goes on to say that for most of us, life just sort of rushes at us, one thing after another. And we don't know at the time what's important and what's unimportant, what's consequential and what's trivial. It's probably a good thing that we didn't know. Because if we did, We'd be driven to our knees, knowing that this, this moment, which has all of the appearance of the trivial and the inconsequential, is a watershed, a turning point in my life. But we don't know. And so we just sort of blunder through life, taking moments as they come and treating every moment as though it's just one stupid thing after another. And we just wade through it and we do it. And it's in retrospect, it's in the rearview mirror that we understand how important these moments were. As a pastor, I can't tell you how many times people have come into my office and sat down and said, if I had known then what I know now, <laughs> the conversations that begin like that, if I had just known then, what I know now, but we don't know. We have to take it as it comes. 
And so we stumble from one moment to the next, not knowing how high the stakes really are. Not knowing that somehow, somewhere, some way, some angel is hanging over the balcony watching us in silent vigil, waiting to exhale to see what we're going to do. It's an apt image for the church that John describes in the book of Revelation. John wrote near the end of the first century of the Christian era, and the church, especially the church in the Roman Empire, and most especially in the Roman province of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, the church was experiencing intense persecution at the hands of the empire and because of the champions of the imperial cult. You see, one of the things I always tell my students is that you have to remember when you open the New Testament, you've left your 21st century Gentile world. You're in the world of first century Judaism. Jesus was a Jew and all the disciples were Jews and this book was composed by Jews for Jews. It is a thoroughly Jewish world you're in when you're in the New Testament. And those first Christians were Jews. And so if you had asked a pagan, if you had asked a Roman, uh, what's the difference between a Jew and a Christian, they would have no idea what you're talking about. So far as they were concerned, Christians were Jews, and Jews were Jews were Jews, and they treated Jews the same. And so the Roman Empire, in, in order to hold on to its power over these conquered peoples, had two ingenious strategies. One, they they prohibited the spread of new religions because with new religions comes nationalistic fervor. We're seeing that with the rise of Islam, particularly in our country. Uh, the other thing they did is that they compelled the worship of the emperor. It was called the imperial cult, emperor worship. Every major city of the empire had a temple dedicated to the worship of Rome, the mother country, the symbol for which was the emperor. And so there were temples dedicated to the emperor. And people from all over the city would go to the temple at the prescribed time and they would say a prayer, they would light a candle, they would offer a sacrifice. Not because they believed the emperor was God, they were not stupid. It was more patriotism, like putting your hand over your heart, saying I pledge allegiance to the empire and the emperor who stands for the empire, or singing the Roman version of the Star Spangled Banner. Nobody really believed he was God. But to show that you were a good Roman citizen, you went to the temple and you offered sacrifices to the emperor. Everybody did except Jews. Because Jews had ringing in their ear that commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the Romans, having fought three bloody wars with the Jews, realized they were not going to win this one. So they grandfathered them in. Jews were exempt from emperor worship. And so long as Romans could not distinguish between Jews and Christians, so too were Christians. See, Romans just thought they were Jews. So they didn't have to worship the emperor. But things changed in the 60s. A new emperor came to the throne whose name was Nero. And for the first time, he singles out Christians for persecution. You see, he can tell the difference. He didn't single out Jews in Rome, Christians. And he sent them into the arena and he persecuted them. And then when the book of Revelation is written in the 90s, there is an emperor on the throne whose name is Domitian. And he declares open season on Christians. Not just in Rome, but out in the empire, in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, where these churches to which John writes his book of Revelation reside. Churches like Ephesus and Theatira and Sardis and Pergamum and Laodicea. In his famous letter to the seven churches, John gives us a sociological study of the impact of this emperor worship and persecution on Christians in Asia Minor. And perhaps nowhere is that impact more prominent than in Pergamum. Some of you, no doubt, have been to Pergamum. It's in Turkey. And the ruins of the ancient city of Pergamum are there. It, it, it sits astride an impressive Acropolis. And the Acropolis overlooks this magnificent valley called the Bakaji Valley in Turkey. 
And at the base of the Acropolis is a temple dedicated to Zeus, the father god. Jupiter was his Roman name. And there's an impressive temple there. Uh, there is also carved into the side of the Acropolis a theater dedicated to the god of the theater and the god of wine. Bacchus was his Roman name. Dionysius was his Greek name. And, the and plays were celebrated there. And you can still see the theater today. It seats 5,000 people. Down in the valley was uh, a healing center dedicated to the Greek god of healing, Asclepius. But on top of the Acropolis, perched like a paean of, of Pergamum's patriotism, was a temple not to Zeus, but to Trajan, the Roman emperor. And people from Pergamum would go and light their candles and offer their sacrifices to show that they were faithful Romans, except the Christians. And down in the valley, in Christian homes, the controversy and the conversation started. Well, what are we going to do if we don't go to the temple, if we don't light a candle, if we don't burn a sacrifice and burn incense? They'll, they'll come and take us. They'll take the kids. They'll throw them into the arena. They'll feed them to the lions. What are we going to do? I mean, what's the harm? We just go to the temple. We don't believe Trajan is God. Nobody will know. We'll have our fingers crossed behind our back. Nobody will know. What's the harm? And John pans the camera back and shows them what's really going on from heaven's perspective. It's that magnificent vision I just read. Keep in mind that in the book of Revelation, you have a, a dual reality. You have an earthly reality and you have a heavenly reality. And the heavenly reality mirrors the earthly reality. And so the Son of Man walks among the seven golden lampstands in heaven, but each of those lampstands has its physical reality on earth. Actually, the word in the Greek, liknia, doesn't really mean lampstand. It's a menorah, the Jewish candelabra. Christians were Jews, Jesus believing Jews. And so there are seven of these golden menorah in heaven, and each one has its own angel tending the flame, uh, trimming the wick, making sure the oil is there, making sure the candle remains lit. Because if it goes out, remember the correlation, then the, the church on earth is no longer the church. And John shows how high the stakes really are as the Son of Man moves among the candelabra and down on earth Christians are debating, what do we do? What do we do? Do we remain faithful to our belief that Jesus only is Lord at the risk of our lives? What do we do? And John says, the stakes are higher than you think. You stand fast. You stand firm. You confess Jesus only is Lord, even if you sit in the shadow of where Satan sits. Because if you don't, I will come and move your lampstand out of its place. Somewhere, John says, the angels are watching, holding their breath. And so it is with you and me. Decisions made which at the time seemed minor and inconsequential. I mean, what's a little white lie? We didn't mean any harm. What, what's, a, what's a cruel glance, a, a, a sarcastic word? I mean, we didn't really mean it. And John says, if you could see what you do and what you say from heaven's perspective, you would realize that everything you do carries or crushes heaven's hopes. Everything matters. There are no inconsequential moments. There was a movie some years ago called Flatliners. I don't know whether you saw it. It's really a kind of a sci-fi story, weird little story, about some medical students who decided that they wanted to conduct an experiment to see what was on the other side of life. 
And so they used a defibrillator to flatline each other. And then they would make excursions to the other side. And then they would use the defibrillator to bring them back in the hope that they would retain some memory of what was on the other side. I told you it was weird. Uh, but they did that. Each of them did that. What they didn't realize is that when they went to the other side and came back, they brought the other side with them. And it came back. And things that had only been memories become palpable realities that not only harm them, but hurt them and haunt them. There is a moving scene between two characters, one played by Kiefer Sutherland, the other played by Julia Roberts. And Kiefer Sutherland is trying to explain to Julia Roberts why his demons are not so easily exercised. It seems that when he was a, a little boy, there was an ugly scene in which the neighbor boys picked on this little meek child. They bullied him. They would chase him down the street. One day it got out of hand. They chased him down the street. He climbed up into a tree. He, he said, I don't know who did it. No, I don't know. But all of a sudden, somebody reached down. Maybe it was me. I don't know. Picked up a rock and threw it up into the tree. And suddenly, there was a hailstorm of rocks into the tree. One of them hit the little boy. He fell out of the tree on his neck, broke his neck, and died. Now, how do you fix that? And now... Kiefer Sutherland is telling Julia Roberts, my past is haunting me and it's coming back and it's haunting and hurting and harming and injuring me. And she says, but, but it was a long time ago. You were a little boy. You didn't know what you were doing. You didn't mean it. You were a different person then. That was then. This is now. It, it, it doesn't matter. And he looked at her and said, you don't get it, do you? Everything matters. Everything we do matters. Years ago, I was pastor of First Baptist Church in Raleigh. My wife was singing in the choir, and um, I had usually had meetings after the Wednesday night service, and so I would go on home. She would come home after choir rehearsal. She had given me instructions to stop by the Seva Center uh, there on Six Forks and buy uh, a pound of uh, coffee beans because we were out of coffee. And so I did. It was probably quarter to ten by the time I got there. Very few people in the store. I went straight way to the coffee aisle and got my coffee beans, headed up to the front. But about that time, all of the lawyers in Raleigh had gotten off, you know, and Raleigh has more lawyers than people in it. Uh, and so they were all in the theater lined, I mean, they were all in the Seva Center lined up. I took my place behind all of those attorneys, you know, with their three-piece suits on, very anxious to get through the line and go on to their business. There was a woman in front of me who had two little boys, looked like to be six years of age, I guess, cute little guys, looked to be twins, though I couldn't tell for sure because really they were just a blur. They were just everywhere, you know. They were running around grabbing potato chips and candy and picking magazines up off the rack, you know, and she was trying to corral those little guys. She had a basket with a few things in it. It looked like a can of green beans and a couple of cucumbers and a loaf of bread, a couple of items. And I was standing there just trying to stay out of their line of fire. I mean, they were stepping on my feet. You know, they were bumping into me, you know, and running around. Stop that. She, quit that. Quit running around. You're going to fall. Stop that. You can't read that magazine. Put it back. Get your finger out of your brother's ear. And she was giving them instructions, you know. And I'm standing there thinking, just get me out of here. <laughs> she finally gets to the front, and she puts her items down, and she opens her purse and takes out two food stamps. One in a $5 denomination, one in a $1 denomination. The cashier had told her that'll be $6.50. She said, I've got some change, just a minute. Now the boys are just going crazy. They're just going berserk. And she's searching through her purse, trying to find 50 cents. Now the line is behind me, 14 deep, with attorneys all going, <clears throat> looking at their watches. And I'm thinking, what in the world am I going to do? I'm so nervous, I'm jingling a pocket full of change. And I think, you idiot. Why don't you take 50 cents out and say, ma'am, let me buy those cucumbers for you. And I almost had the words out. 
but I didn't say anything. I thought, you just can't lose control like that, can you? I don't know her, and she doesn't know me. What if she wheels on me and makes a scene? Well, put your money back. I don't want to be your project. I mean, it could get ugly. What, what if it, what, she was very attractive? What if it was worse? She thought I was hitting on her. How's that going to look in the Raleigh News and Observer the next morning? Pastor of First Baptist Church arrested for soliciting and save the center. I mean, all of this is going through my mind. And I'm jingling my change thinking, what am I going to do? Just take the money out. No, you can't do that. Take the No, no. And I didn't say anything. I, my God, I didn't say anything. And she said, put the cucumbers back. And I thought, ma'am, don't do that. cashier checked her out. I put my coffee up there. I throw a $20 bill down. She gives me my change. She says, I'm sorry you had to wait, sir. I muttered something. I don't know what. But I was feeling bad. I was feeling really bad. I, I got my coffee. And as I walked to the door and those sliding glass doors opened, downtown Raleigh, the doors opened. And all of a sudden, I had this feeling that somebody was watching. And it works the other way, too. It does. Little acts of grace that at the time grow more out of integrity than intention can make all the difference in the world for someone. And because it makes all the difference in the world for someone, it makes all the difference in the world. Ruth made all the difference for me. I was a college freshman and English major at Palm Beach Atlantic University. Dr. Ruth Whitford was my English professor. A remarkable woman. PhD from NYU. She had written her dissertation on T.S. Eliot. But what really intrigued me was she had done a year of postdoctoral work at Magdalen College, Cambridge, wait for it, with C.S. Lewis. And so whenever I met her, she said, Wayne, you, you're going into ministry. You're studying for the ministry. There's some people you need to know who put faith and literature together in beautiful ways, J.R.R. Tolkien and G.K. Chesterton and George MacDonald and C.S. Lewis. I devoured their writings, everything they wrote. I committed it to memory. Her classes were amazing. She would just sit in a circle with 10, 12, 15 English majors, and she would invite the greatest literary minds of the ages to come in one after the other and sit there and tell their stories. Moliere. I still remember his Tartuffe and listening to Ruth tell those stories. Mallory, Spencer, and Shakespeare, Turgenev, and Dostoevsky, and Tolstoy, one after the other they would come in. I was hooked. I hated those 50-minute classes. 50 minutes just wasn't long enough for what she was bringing into the room. But, but, I was also a fireball youth evangelist at the time. I was out preaching every weekend. And um, my schedule got away from me, got a little busy, and I didn't really have time to study for the midterm as I would have. And so I knew I didn't do very well on the midterm. She was handing out papers. She came to my desk and she put the paper down and she said, Wayne, I had to look at this twice. I couldn't believe this was your work. I'm, I, I'm ashamed to tell you what I said. But we're friends, I'll tell you what I said. I looked at her and I said, well, Doc, I didn't have time to study. I was too busy out doing the Lord's work. She should have just backhanded me right on the spot and said, that's the Lord's work. But she didn't. She leaned down and she said, might we have a moment of conversation after class? 
I went to her office, dusty little room filled with books, floor to ceiling, sat down and she said, Wayne, I'm not against heartfelt religion. God knows I'm grateful that you're exercising the gifts he's given you. But where did you ever get the idea that your head and your heart were enemies? They're not. Do you remember what Jesus said when he was asked to sum it all up? He quoted the Shema, which she then quoted in Hebrew. Shema, O Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And then she translated it. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. Go back and look it up in the Old Testament. Mind isn't in there. Jesus added it. Must have thought it was important. Hmm. And then she said something I'll never forget. She said, Wayne, I'm a Christian for two reasons. Because it makes sense and feels right. I wouldn't be a Christian if it just made sense and didn't feel right. And I wouldn't be a Christian if it felt right but didn't make sense. In my Christian faith, my head and my heart are one. I left that office that day and I swore an oath to myself, I will never, ever, ever again disappoint that woman. It took tremendous courage to do what she did. I don't even know why she did it. I mean, I've been a professor and I've had smart aleck little jerks like me in my classroom. <laughs> it's just so easy to ignore them. I mean, and there was a moment I thought I saw, there was a moment when she considered it. What am I doing wasting time with this idiot? This is terminal ignorance. You know, I could be writing a book. I could be straightening out my office. I could be doing a number of any kinds of important. I could be having a root canal. Anything's better than this. <laughs> and the angels held their breath. And she said, might we have a conversation in my office? I don't know, folks, and I don't know who knows when it's important and when you can just blow it off. I wish I knew. If I knew, I'd tell you. But I don't know, and I don't know who knows. When it counts, when it doesn't. All I know is that somehow, some way, for someone, everything. And so, brothers and sisters, John and C.S. Lewis and Ruth Whitford and I have a gospel word for you. Stand firm. Hold fast. Be faithful in the place where God has put you, even if the place where God has put you is in the cold, chilly shadow of where Satan sits. Stand fast. And if you do, who knows? Maybe somehow, some way, somewhere, some angel leaning over the balcony, waiting in silent vigil, holding their breath, waiting to exhale, to see what you're going to do. We'll watch you. And breathe a little easier. Father, bless your word this day. Wherever it is preached. Wherever it is lived. To the end that it might be accorded lodging in the hearts of many to your glory and our salvation.